everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here in Boston, Massachusetts with Zach Johnson. Um, we're actually in Sattler College right now. And if I understand right, you're director of operations. Correct. Currently. Yes. Yep. Cool. And you've lived in Boston for several years now. Correct. This is my second year working with Sattler, and I went to school here for a couple of years before that. Okay. Awesome. The thing that, that interests me about your story is you were part of the Air Force at one point and then eventually left. Can you talk, walk us through that? Like, how did, what made you enter basic training for starters, and, and what prompted you to be in that journey? My parents were missionaries down in Quito, Ecuador, so I was born and raised down there, and I went to a church called English Fellowship Church, which means that the best way I described it is you, if you're a Christian and you spoke English, you went to that church. <laughs> and interesting. It's an interesting community. And so what ended up happening was a lot of the ex expats or the people working at the embassy mm -hmm. would, would be a part of that church. So there was a pretty intense military community among my church. And then later on, when, when about when the high school students turn 18, many of the missionary kids end up trying to choose what they're going to do later. Almost all of them leave. And so in that search, my dad had been doing some work down in Peru after this big earthquake hit in around 2008. And he came back and he said, he said the Air Force was amazing. They, were, they set up the hmm. airfields. The planes came in with like all the humanitarian aid drops. And without the Air Force, none of this aid could have been delivered. Mm -hmm. And so that, that started, sort of my gears started turning there about, oh, like this is this incredible organization mm -hmm. that has reach into all corners of the world. And so I started talking to a few of the guys in my church who were also part of the Air Force, and they were really supportive of me trying to pursue that. Hmm. And so kind of at this, this moment of turning 18, I thought joining the military was like this incredible endeavor of service. So at my graduation, I, uh, I applied to a place called the Air Force Academy, which is one of the, four, or one of the five service academies in the US. Mm -hmm. And my, the whole community stood up and gave me a big applause. And, kind of sent me on my way to, to service. Yeah, so where, where is that, the Air Force Academy? That's in Colorado Springs. Okay, so then from there you would have moved to Colorado Springs, Correct. done your training, how long were you in training and all of that? The academies work a little bit differently than enlisting in, in the, normal, the normal way into the service as a, an enlisted member, but you're there for basic training for about the whole summer. So your basic mm -hmm. training lasts from June to like the beginning of, or the end of August. So it's a long summer of basic training. That's really interesting. And, and they paid for my ticket from keto to oh. go. Like it was, I was worried about paying for school and it was like. And it was all covered. It was like, if you come here and you get in, we'll pay for your ticket and all you give us your ser the service back, which is a ton of, that's a lot of peace for like a missionary kid trying to pay for college. Yeah. But not with a ton of financial resources. Wow. So, so there's a financial part of it as well that was really comforting. That's interesting though, what's prompting you is more, it sounds like it was more the service aspect, the humanitarian aspect, not, yeah. not militarily. It, defin it definitely was, although you, you grew up in the 9-11 age and mm -hmm. if you were living overseas during that time, it was kind of like this moment where you, you kind of felt like if mm -hmm. you're an American, you had to sort of give back to protect mm -hmm. your interest abroad and mm -hmm. I, that, that narrative kind of played in my mind for most of my life as well. I believed it. I remember my, my community just showing the videos of, of Saddam Hussein and burning mm. the oil fields and being like, this, this is evil mm. and sort of the, the US, the Christian nations need to move to stop this. Yeah. So it was a little bit of both, but the main narrative was driven from my dad working with uh, humanitarian aid. So I'm curious, in this whole process, after you enlisted, did you ever second guess your decision because of your faith as, you know, as a believer? That's an interesting story. So at the academy, you, you spend four years there. Mm -hmm. And then after you go for two years, the first day you show up your third year is called commitment day. And once you go through that day, you sign this paper and you're committed for for seven years. So there, there's this one day that comes up and everybody is, is sort of like, ah, oh, is he gonna sign the paper? And it turns out that there's a small contingent of Mormons at the Air Force Academy who would go on missions, mandatory missions, and they would quit and they would do a two year mission and then they would come back to finish up their training. Hmm. And I was kind of sitting here thinking to myself, how is it that the LDS church is sort of taking over the world and here I am with my Protestant evangelical roots thinking, I need to go do this too. Like I need to find something 
So I actually quit the academy after my second year. Wow. And spent a year in Mozambique where my boss was a, a Quaker. No way. Yeah, he okay. was a Quaker. Wow. And he engaged with me pretty pretty offhandedly, very non-threatening way, just kind of pushing me a tiny bit about, hey, have you thought about whether or not violence is the answer? And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, no Christian had really kind of pushed back on me yet. After that year, I did come back and I, was, I had to reapply. And there were a few questions about, can a follower of Jesus be in the military? Mm -hmm. So I did, I actually did, I, I sent a, like that question, 35 people in my trusted circles. 34 answered back with a resounding yes. One of them, my, my brother-in-law was, was still sort of hesitant about that. But I, th I thought about it while I was in the military, or while I was serving. But then, you know, there was this moment of a pretty intense corruption in the work I was doing over in, in Mozambique. And I was like, ah, I got it. The only way to end this is with violence, really. That's what I mm -hmm. concluded. But I did think about it. In, in that year specifically while mm -hmm. I was doing a, a religious mission. So once you, once you were done there, did you rejoin the academy then? I did, mm -hmm. yeah. And then there are really interesting conversations back in 2013, 2014 about the word proselytizing. It's basically when you're in a position of power in the military over someone else, mm -hmm. that you sharing faith with that person in any authoritative manner is against your commission. So like you can't be sharing your faith in a position of power to a subordinate. And that those thoughts are really interesting because you agree to you agree to this notion that you're not mm. going to be proselytizing. It's a it's sort of a negative spin on evangelizing. Sort of wrestling with those thoughts too were interesting to me to say, all right, can I agree to not share or like tell people they should be looking at the Christian faith from a position of power. So huh, that's an, uh -huh. there's a sort of an interesting piece there that we were wrestling with. And there were a bunch of people at the academy getting in trouble for promoting different religious organizations and institutions. They would get up and they would tell the, everybody like, oh, you should, you should promote this, I remember. Have you heard of like the, the chew boxes delivered at Christmas time? Yeah. Like yeah. people were promoting that and then like literally it would, the academy would make headlines about you know this the military is promoting christianity and oh, so I, I, did, I did think about it mm -hmm. a little bit and mm -hmm. so there there's a little bit of ah, vexation trying to deal with yeah. those issues from a young age but you don't really i didn't really dive too far into it there's an african-american writer an amazing writer his name is frederick Douglass, who he has this great line he says it is easier to raise strong children than repair broken men. And that is a line that all of us who are parents who care about this issue should consider deeply. It's a lot easier to change yourself when you're 16, 17, 18, versus when you're 40 or 50 years old. We're all creatures who have a certain momentum to who we are and a certain set of qualities that become ossified as we get older. But these, this basic idea of, of shaping ourselves and crafting ourselves. And I would say the glory of the gospel, the glory of Christianity is transformation. It's taking people who were one way and they become a different way. Going with that same thread, how did your involvement with the military affect your personal living out what you believe. Did, did it affect your practice of Christianity at all? I would say it was a confusing time of, hmm. of finding, f I think finding the ch a church was the most confusing part of being in the military. I think mm -hmm. even with my friends who are still in the military, they're getting, you know, they're getting sent around and tossed every year, every two years. Finding a community in the military, like a, a solid, stable community is really, I think, the hardest part of practicing a faith. So in Colorado Springs, it's sort of a mecca of a mecca of Christianity. There's a church on every corner. I could have gone to a different church every Sunday. And, and that's kind of what ended up happening. So a lot of us, you don't really know what you're looking for in a church. And so you end up sort of your Christian community becomes whoever you can find and associate with. 
you know, of having different views. And there's, there's this notion that, yeah, I believe in God, but I don't really know what I believe about him or what church to join. Wow. So that was sort of the, the biggest problem for me. And then just personally, my, my walk in, in holiness and purity was hit pretty hard, mm -hmm. especially after sort of being surrounded by people and just wanting social camaraderie. I did, I did pretty poorly in, in establishing a group of like faithful believers to pour mm -hmm. into me. And so you end up kind of feeling like you're walking with, with one foot in one world, one foot in the other. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of like this uh, work hard, play hard Christianity where you sort of work and but then you play hard with your friends. And it's, it's an interesting community. Yeah. It doesn't sound like um, what, what we would think of as the ideal for a Christian to have in a community of believers around them. Yeah. You know, and that support base. Well, like you're saying that stability yeah. isn't really there. And, and I'm not saying that what happened to me is what happens to everybody. Mm -hmm. It was my experience. I know that I could have been more stable and mm -hmm. kind of more, more faithful. But if you're trying to submit to a church and you're being told, all right, in two years you're leaving here, you'll be there for two years, and then you're going here, it's really hard to really build a church community under that model. And I think that a lot of us, especially later in life, I think, well, I should be making decisions to build my life around the church mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of making other decisions and then figuring out church later was yeah. a big, big component to it. Here's where it starts getting really interesting because you don't, you're not in the Air Force anymore. I'm not, no. So, so what happened? Where was the change of beliefs and, and how did that come about? It's a million dollar question. So, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll kind of finish my story here. So I went back to the academy and spent two years there. And then the academy, I, I did pretty well in school. So they looked at they looked at me and they said, hey, you should apply for grad school spots. Mm -hmm. That's just going to get a master's degree. And there, the Air Force Academy has these these uh, three spots to go to the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Harvard, like right over. Literally, yeah, it's right right out this window right oh, here. Oh wow! I I competed for a spot to go to the Kennedy School of Government, and mm -hmm. this was really it was like all these things were clicking in my mind because mm -hmm. this is a school that pumps out international presidents, a lot of diplomats, wow. a lot of ambassadors, and so in my mind. I was thinking, oh, I could go here and I could be like the American ambassador to Ecuador. I, I left this out, but I had dual citizenship with Ecuador. And then when you join the military, they actually make you renounce that citizenship to get a security clearance. So I was going, so I came into the school of government really sort of gun ho on. Wait, so you did actually go to the school then? Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So right wow. after Colorado Springs, the Air Force sent me here to Boston. And my first assignment, I was a second lieutenant commissioned, was to go get a master's degree and sort of represent wow. the Air Force at the Kennedy School of Government. These years, you know, I, it's super interesting to be a military, they called us straight white males. There's a, not that many of us here at the, the Kennedy School who had, I would say, more of a conservative viewpoint on life across a few political indicators. Mm -hmm. I'll let the audience guess what some of those indicators <laughs> would be. So this was a super interesting time for me because when you, are raised as a Christian conservative, and then you are confronted with a lot of smart, liberal hmm. thinking people who are sort of giving you a prescriptive model of how to run the world, basically how, how governments should function. I started just battling with how on earth is it that I, as a, mili a Christian in the military, can be subordinate to this government system that I don't really agree with all the, the principles holding on. I'm sitting here and a bunch of my buddies, and we, we espouse to be Christians, and we're, we're second lieutenants, and we're saying, all right, we're gonna be the ones in charge of making the decisions to take life, to not take life. That, that's kind of what it felt like. But I can't, I don't agree with any of these outcomes. <laughs> it was kind of a political, uh, hmm. like, really turmoil that I was like, I, I don't know what the outcome is here. I don't, I don't yeah. feel comfortable either way politically. I started thinking about the, the idea of legislating my morality upon other people who didn't have the same morality. There's, you end up like making friends with people you disagree with. And th those, those political thoughts really, really drove me to like an uncertainty and almost like a spiritual depression of not knowing like, all right, what is the, like what, what, yeah. is this, what does this all mean? Why is there no clear path out? 
I feel like I've dug myself into a corner that I can't get out of. I bounced around churches a ton here and it was really, it, it was kind of like an upsetting time in life because I was, I felt like I was on top of the world because, you know, I was, I was studying and I was learning a lot, but my, my spirituality didn't make, like nothing was clicking with the, the path I'd laid out with, all right, I'm going to make my way up to in government and sort of rain down my Christian my Christianity in a really good way on others, and it just wasn't clicking. Yeah, and that's where I bound, ran into Dr. Finney Caravilla. I, I'm sure some of you know his name. He's the founder of Sattler College. Mm -hmm. I was like, I was searching for church, man. I was, I just didn't know who thought the way I did. I, like the Bible wasn't clicking. Nothing made sense. I was just like, I just need to be a good person. And then for the first time, I like went over to Followers of the Way after meeting him and like saw saw head covering for the first time saw modest dress for the first time and I, was, I was like no like these people are weird but just, <laughs> <laughs> these people are really weird and i was just searching for a faithful people yeah kind of like not what you were looking for initially like. not really like i didn't know what i was looking for and then somebody handed me his book it's called king jesus claims his church and then i opened it up and i leafed through the the beginning pages and there's a chapter called peacemaking and non-resistance and i read it quick and i was like oh they, they like think i'm not a christian i was just like this is horrible like, i really thought i had found some answers here but that that initial encounter with a group of people that mm. takes th the commandments of god seriously and literally it was really something like consistent that i thought was so refreshing whereas if i were to go i was attending a, a church um not not too far away from here and after the outcome of the election like people it seemed like people came to church like wearing sackcloth and ashes and they were mourning and i was thinking about this i was like our hope shouldn't be in this political outcome and i can't put all everything that i have my life at stake in these outcomes and at school their mm -hmm. students were weeping it was just a wow it was a really intense season to be like why is it that humanity the circles i was part of have placed so much of their life Mm -hmm. at this political outcome that it seems uncontrollable. And so I, I engaged with, with Finney and Followers of the Way for about three months. They were super loving to me. They, were, they understood where I could, came from. They were supportive. They'd, they had me over to their homes. And then I kind of went on this quest to, to dig into this earlier question of, can a follower of Jesus be in the military? Mm -hmm. And sort of, I put like all my all my energy into that and I, re I went to the library, Harvard Divinity School Library, I checked out a stack of books like this big <laughs> and I was just reading it and I, I, gave, like, I gave up on Just War really fast. Wow. I, so it was a pretty quick, but like when you actually made that step to, to dive into it and really look at it honestly, you realize this Just War thing is just not working. Just War is an outflow of the two kingdoms. We have an instinct that there's a governance here on earth and we need to be a part of it. But the, just the framework that, no, Jesus came to establish a rival nation among nations, and your allegiance is to him, and it can't be to these other nations. Yeah, it went away really fast for me, cause, because I felt like it was an answer to like all of this uncertainty that had been brewing for like my whole, basically from 18 to, to 24, just like searching for, mm -hmm. for answers about why is it that the Bible says this, but we don't do it. A lot of those, those questions as well. So I decided to, there's more to that story, but that's sort of how I decided to leave the Air Force. And it was a, yeah, and I, I can talk more about that later if you have more questions. Sure. So you get to the place where I don't want to be part of the Air Force anymore because this just is not compatible with Christianity. So you, you make that decision. What's your next step? Did you face a, a lot of opposition? Were you able to just leave? <laughs> no, no, not at all. So <laughs> I didn't think so. Yeah. So I was, I was in kind of a precarious situation because the Air Force had sent me to school. Right. And I had finished a year, so I was about mid -may through my second year. Mm -hmm. And I came to these convictions. It basically boiled down to me, and when I was engaging with the church, I was saying, I will stay in the military if they don't make me use violence, and if they don't make me use oaths, and all these things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually funny that the, the thing that it came down to was the oath, that, that the Air Force would have put me in a, you can file as a, I don't want to use violence, but you can't be in the Air Force and not take an oath hmm. when you promote. So I was basically like searching for a way to stay in under the convictions that I 
developed. Wow, yeah. Because I'll, I'll explain a little bit more that the amount, how it was explained to me was if I left my commitment early that I would owe, the number they gave me was half a million dollars of debt back to the government. I was thinking to myself, I can't afford that. If I make this decision, Whoa. there's a lot, there's a lot at stake. That's a lot at stake. So there's a guy that basically looked at me. He, he was also, he shared my convictions, but he had got out after he kind of came to them. And he said, you're going to live in poverty if you make this decision forever, basically. Mm. Like you probably won't be able to have a family. You probably, so I'm like thinking to myself, ah, oh, is this worth it? And so that, that debt piece was really sort of the big one that, that I was scared of. And also, I didn't want to make it look like I was riding the Air Force's system to get a degree and then to just bounce once I, once I had it, just to leave and say, ah, thanks for, thanks for all the education, see you later. Mm -hmm. So I turned it in as soon as I could to say, hey, pull me out of school, I don't need the degree. Like, I'm trying to show you that my convictions are sincere and I'll, I'll take whatever the, the consequences are. So you enter a process called becoming a conscientious objector and you file through each, each branch of the military has different ways you file. But the way that I've described the process to people is I, I assembled a 70 page document that went through answering, oh. answering all the questions about my sincerity and, and these things. So you get this package together. I had to write all my friends and family asking for letters of reference to, to support my sincerity. And that was, that was wow. probably the hardest part because it was like, if you come from my background, you can imagine, I didn't know anybody outside of Followers of the Way that would agree with me. So I had to ask my parents, my friends in the military. It was hard, man. There's, mm -hmm. because obviously when you engage with someone you love and they're your friend, you're saying, hey man, I know we're in this military thing together, but I'm out because of my pursuit of Christ. They kind of look at you and they're like, what are you saying about me? Like, yeah. should, should I be doing that too? And you're like, yes. <laughs> like, deep down, Ooh. deep down, yes. And That's a hard, hard journey. That, that process was kind of intense and mm -hmm. just, you know, having some parents that really supported you through it and a community that was like, they were really proud of you. And mm -hmm. so sort of, it felt like giving up a lot of support that I had experienced Although it was hard, it was a good experience. And then mm -hmm. I assembled that package. You go and you turn it into the base. And it, I remember my heart, I was holding it in my car. My heart was just pounding. <laughs> like, do I really want to do this? And that's after talking to, you know, commanders. I remember the first time I told my commander that I wanted to leave because of this. Like, it's, it feels like you're giving up your whole life just because this, well, like yeah. this was like a seven year pursuit and you have no idea what's after. For me, that was like a big question. Like, what on earth am I gonna do after this? Like, I'm gonna be like on the street. I, I thought, I don't know what I thought I was, was gonna happen. But then, so you get assigned a lawyer through the Air Force, or a JAG is what they call them. And they sort of take that application and they read through it. And so with the Air Force, I had to establish that I first of all religious. So I went and talked to a chaplain and talked about the Bible, talked about the Sermon on the Mount. And I remember, <laughs> I remember that conversation going something like, I can see your perspective, but sometime an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, like that's so, the way this world works. He just didn't agree with you. No, didn't yeah. agree, but, but was like very sympathetic and mm -hmm. supportive. And then, then so I, I established my sincerity and then you have to establish your sanity. So that was with a mental health doctor. So you go up to a, a mental health doctor and he asks you questions. My interview was like three hours long. And he asked me Whoa. questions like, how do you know when you're hungry? <laughs> that's, that's the question I always bring up. I'm like, how do I know when I'm hungry? <laughs> and that's a, but the, so like, you have to wow. establish that you're not insane because they bring up this, do you know you're gonna, might owe half a million dollars? Well, and yeah. Do you know what you're doing? Uh, do you know the implication of this? You're not gonna have a job. Like, you're not gonna have healthcare, all these things. And, and then you have a trial with a lawyer after you're religious, sane, and sincere. And so Dr. Carrillo was a witness at my trial Wow. came up and so the lawyer is examining all the evidence to determine whether or not you are sane, sincere, and religious. And so that process takes like, like that took three months. And then once the lawyer turns it in, officers in the military, the application has to go to all the way up to the White House to be signed off. So it goes through your Whoa. first chain of command, your second chain of command, and then your third, which is at the White House. 
So it took like, I think it was an eighth month process. So in the middle of that, like I, when you turn it in, I gave up my, my rank and my pay and got the salary cuts and all that stuff. And then I got sent to another base too. So that was a, an intense experience too. But yeah, that's sort of how from conviction to getting out. It's mm -hmm. a it's a interesting experience, but I will say it's super fruitful to assemble that 70 page package. Like I was reading the Bible like I'd never read before. <laughs> well, I, was I, like, bet. I was like, yeah. this place, this place. And I was learning about Christian history mm -hmm. and just like really owning my faith felt like something I'd never done before. And although my foundations, like I remember staying up at night being like, I'm insane. Like <laughs> nobody's gonna take me seriously ever again in, in life. But it, it's a, it was a rewarding experience too, because mm -hmm. to be able to look at someone and be like, I stood for my convictions, even if you might not agree with them is, is sort of a, a really peaceful thing to be able to say at the end yeah. of the day. I, I got stationed at, in LA, there's an Air Force base in LA and I worked for them as a sort of the bottom rank and all my friends had promoted. It's a really small world actually. So a lot of my classmates from the academy, the only way that you don't promote the first time is if you do something pretty bad. So everyone like was looking at me and they were like, I thought you were like a superstar. Like, yeah, what, like what, what evil like, thing did who you did do? you kill or <laughs> who did you assault that made yeah. you lose your rank? I explained sort of how I'd come to these convictions. And it was really, I was, my job was to be a congressional analyst so I was like hosting these senator visits to the base. And I, was like, oh. why? I was like, why is the Air Force trusting me with this? Wow. And it was this kind of period of, I'm gonna do my best while I'm here and mm -hmm. really submit to what the arrangements I've made. But at the, by the end of the summer, I, was the, I got this email. It was like, your application has been approved by the secretary of the Air Force. They sit, so they sit at the White House and I walked into my boss's office. I was like, it came in. And she, my, my mom had also passed away that summer. So it was like, it was like kind of an intense wow. summer all around, but she was just like so happy for me. But she said, all right, I'm gonna need you to go and report to this. There's a, a Lieutenant Colonel, it's like an 05 or the fifth, the fifth rank of, among officers. And the Lieutenant Colonel read through my application and he had, he had a Bible on his desk too. And he was <laughs> like, and he was like, oh, I've been to Ecuador. I probably know where you grew up in. He looked at me and said, all right, for the next 12 days, my only job is to out-process you, which means to like leave the base and mm -hmm. make sure your medical stuff is clear, your pace, everything is set up. And he said, I want you to know in 12 days, you're gonna have this half a million dollar debt. So I looked at him and I was like, well, like I agreed to it, that's fine with me. So 12 days later, it's my last day, walk into his office, everything was done. And he just looked exhausted. He was like leaning back in his chair, <laughs> just like, like messy hair and he said I've called every single number I know how to call and I don't know how to give you this debt like nobody knows how to give it to you <laughs> and he said I don't know so I can't keep you here you're free to leave and you may or may not get a notification in the next period of time or not but I never did I never I didn't that I didn't, is so wild. I didn't try to I didn't try to pursue the debt <laughs> sure. I, I, I asked him I was like is this something I have to look into to give myself <laughs> whatever it is that I paid back and he said no like somebody else is trying to take care of it but I never got a never caught a call back that's why I'm a little nervous always telling these stories because somebody <laughs> might be like I know how to give it to him you know, like, sh <laughs> like show up at the door and be like no my life is ruined <laughs> but <laughs> no wow so that was that was October 2017, and then I drove a week later. I was driving here to Boston to, so year and to, a start, half ago. Sat, to start Sattler, yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That is a roller coaster. So now you're just, you're out. You, uh, you didn't finish your degree, I'm assuming. I finished, they let me finish my degree. They actually let you they finish. They gave me a master's degree. I have, the, I have a master's degree in public policy and government which is very interesting as a kingdom Christian to try to figure out, all right, what do I do with this? <laughs> I got and, it. <laughs> uh, what do I do with this? Who, how can I serve the kingdom with this? But yeah, I got the degree. That's, that, worked, that actually worked out pretty well yeah. in, in the end. I mean, it was crazy. It was a, uh, and then it, it just so happened that, you know, there was a vision here to start a college and there's a faithful church here. Mm -hmm. And you know, that it was a, it's still a little tense with like family and acquaintances from the past sure. about who knew me and were really supportive and they're like, so you bleep what? And just to yeah. explain the new new viewpoints. And then I always explain to people, it's not that 
it's not that crazy what, what I believe and what we believe about what Christ taught. And then you walk them through it and they, they kind of like, oh, that kind of makes sense. I don't agree, but mm -hmm. and that's been, for the most part, my experience. I've walked one other person through the process really? to leave the military as well. And so I, I found one person who was swayed by it, not the Christian, <laughs> fortunately not the Christian perspective, but just the nonviolence mm -hmm. as more of a means of operating in life. So with that whole process of you leaving, what would you say to someone either watching or someone that, you know, that they might know who, who's hearing this that is potentially going to want to leave the military? What piece of advice would you give them? Yeah, there, there's practical advice and then there's sort of life advice. I would say if you're seriously considering leaving and like you've already developed the, the convictions that the, the process actually supports you if you have these convictions and that when you go through it it's like it's it's a really rewarding experience to be able to say that I stood wow. for something I researched it and I I put everything at stake for mm -hmm. for Christ and especially if you're if you're talking about Christ but even any basic conviction but if you're thinking about leaving there's a lot of resources available to you so there's actually Men Mennonite Central Committee they have a military hotline where you call in and you're like, I'm thinking about leaving the military. Wow. And they'll send you, they'll actually send you a bunch of resources. And I actually met the person who picked up the phone when I called in to, wow. to, to, to support me out of it. And they, they plugged me into a place called the Center for Conscious and War, who is basically a team of lawyers that will like talk to you, hear your story, and help you mm. assemble your package. And so another piece of advice is like, you're definitely not alone. That support system's really vital, mm -hmm. especially when you're interacting with, with your family who might not be on the same page with you and previously you might've relied on them for this kind of advice. But yeah, there's practical advice and then there's just this you're not alone tip that like reach out to people, start talking, mm -hmm. get excited about it. I know it's kind of a time of like trepidation. Yeah. Like, oh, should I do this? This is like gonna cost me everything. But it's also a time to like really solidify your allegiance to the Son of God and that notion of being excited about Jesus' kingdom and being able to tell your story to convince others to join too. It's like, it's really exciting. I don't look back on it one moment. I think there's a lot of hard times, but I think following God is really what it comes down to and it's worth it. That's, that's an amazing story. Thank you. That's, yeah, that's whew. all, all to, to God be the glory. I mean, yeah. he walked me through it and I really believe that he people chasing him, they like he networks them somehow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gives them each other. So I'm very yeah. grateful to have met Finney and I met talked to Dean Taylor on the phone too. Uh huh. Read Dean's yeah. book. Watched yeah. the video series yeah. that you you filmed of him mm -hmm. and his story. Back in the day. Yeah. And my I remember my parents came and watched that at Finney's house. Really? No. Or, way. or at least my yeah. mom. And I, I remember them I remember it being a process of like, oh I, I see the logic. Mm -hmm. I see the train of thought that it's this isn't an insanity, like something to do with craziness. Like there's some logic to it and it's not like they had like a visceral reaction like this is just awful. Exactly. But, but they I mean they're probably not necessarily at that point, but they could at least see where you're coming from. Exactly. And that's huge. Yeah. yeah. Back to the if you're thinking about leaving, like mm -hmm. keep going to the Bible. Like mm -hmm. I think that's the the most confident I've ever been is when I was reading the Bible. I'm like, wow, the Bible makes sense. <laughs> it's like this is like the kingdom is it's making sense. Jesus was proclaiming this kingdom. He's like giving us these ways to mm -hmm. follow. I was like, this this is awesome. Like I understand <laughs> the Bible before, like almost like a three year old would. Like I don't need uh -huh. And I think that was just a time of really intense joy in my life, too. Or, that is so cool. We're like, after, you know, interacting mm -hmm. with the Bible and you're like, what does this mean? Like, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. if someone's left you on the right hand, on the right cheek, turn to him, the other also. And you're like, but it doesn't really mean that. <laughs> doesn't really mean military. that. Like, it doesn't really mean that. <laughs> yeah. Oath doesn't really mean you can't take an oath. And so, like, reading the Bible becomes this re refreshing process afterwards where mm -hmm. you, you can say, oh, like, this is life giving and I don't have to, like, second guess. Mm -hmm. Every single thing I read in here about why it doesn't apply to me. I think that was another just really intense time of joy about yeah. learning and well, like a lot of growth. So, Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course. Is there anything else you would want to add? Um, that's the last question I have. We're here at Sattler trying to, to reach people who are passionate about God's kingdom and that too. And like my, one of my missions here is to like find people who would have been in my shoes and like they're thinking about joining the military, but they're not sure. But 
Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm like really passionate about paving, a, like trying to pay, point people to the direction of service that mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't involve making compromises on faith. So come, come look at us at Sattler if you're, mm -hmm. if you're interested. And yeah, God, God bless you if you're, if you're thinking about leaving and all, mm -hmm. all those things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we'll want to make sure and put links to this because what you guys are doing here is, is really amazing. And hopefully we can send some people this direction. And yeah, maybe you can help someone else. You know? yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I, one, one at a time, like I said, one mm -hmm. is left mm -hmm. that I know of. And I'm, yeah. I'd love to create a better network of, of support for people thinking about leaving. Yeah, and, then, and of the people who have come out and if you can network those together. And like you're saying, having that community when someone's coming out. Um, someone to actually walk with you. Totally, yeah. it make it makes a world of difference. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. don't go through it alone. I had, I had Dean, I had, a, I had a bunch of people that I. Mm -hmm. You you have to make the steps to reach out to them. Like I don't know you're there. I have to, yeah. I have to find you. So, but don't be alone. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wow, thank you so much yeah. for sharing. I really appreciate it. Of course. Yeah.